Hello, my name's Brian Murphy. I'm an attorney with Hofeld and Schaffner in Chicago, Illinois. I concentrate my practice in catastrophic personal injury and wrongful death litigation. I've been in practice now for 27 years. I've practiced around the state and in other jurisdictions in areas such as medical malpractice, vehicular negligence, premises liability, products, and aviation. I'm here to talk to you today about the plaintiff's expert, why you need a plaintiff's expert, the things that you have to do uh, to find them, prepare them, produce them, so that your case turns out the way it ought to turn out for you, for your client. Why do you need a plaintiff's expert? Well, in certain circumstances, you have to have a plaintiff's expert. In medical negligence cases, only in the rarest circumstances uh, are you able to proceed to the jury without expert testimony. You need the expert to establish standard of care, proximate cause, and damages. These can be retained experts, 213F3 experts, or 213F2 experts, treating physicians and the like. In circumstances like construction litigation, you'll need individuals such as engineers, you'll need safety people, people who can outline um, some of the facets of construction that don't uh, come naturally or that are not within, as we say, the ken of the average juror. In automobile cases, you know, oftentimes we think we don't need an expert in an automobile case, but there can be uh, certain circumstances where accident reconstruction or biomechanics are necessary. In short, you have to look at your lawsuit critically from the beginning to determine whether you are going to have difficulty proving an element of your case. You know the elements, it's negligence. So you need to show duty, you need to show a breach of that duty, proximate cause, and then the damages. That's the same in a red light case as it is in a failure to diagnose a lung cancer case. Another byproduct or a byproduct of having an expert is that you really get to educate yourself about your case. And when you're educating yourself about your case, a very important thing is to find out what are the weaknesses of your case. If you are going to have an expert, your opponent is going to have an expert. Listen to the people that you retain. Cross-examine those people with the weaknesses that you have in your case. If you don't have any weaknesses in your case, you don't need an expert because your case is going to resolve. In 27 years of practice, I've never had a case that didn't have weaknesses in it. So when you talk with your expert, educate yourself. Learn about the circumstances of the surgical procedure that you are involved in. When you're talking to a biomechanicist or engineer, as it relates, let's say, to a non-medical case. Learn the science behind what they are telling you. You're much better in those circumstances when you are then deposing defendants in the case, when you are uh, dealing with uh, people with expertise that you don't have. You use your expert as a resource. You've decided that you need one or more experts for your case. Where do you find them? They don't grow on trees. Uh, when you are dealing in a medical negligence case, you understand that you're going to be talking to people whom you are going to ask to be critical of colleagues. Not necessarily someone they know, but someone who practices in the same area. Somebody who in your expert's mind has lived some of the hard things maybe that that expert has. So again, where do you find someone who is willing to give you an honest opinion in a medical case or a construction case? A great resource are your colleagues. The plaintiff's bar and the defense bar have organizations that you, you can belong to and frankly you should belong to. Talk with your colleagues. Find out who they have used. Some of those people may not be right for you, but in getting an introduction, you can speak with that expert, and if he or she doesn't work for you, they may be able to refer you to someone else. 
a place where I have had uh, some success in finding experts is actually talking to experts who have been retained against me. When you are deposing an expert, let's say in a medical negligence case, you know when you are dealing with someone who is honest, smart, good, because lots of times they're beating you around the deposition room. I have gone to those people at times and said, look, I have a similar case. Would you be willing to look at it for me? Oftentimes they do. Not often will they come work with me, but sometimes they do. The byproduct of that, though, is that I can get a defense look at my case, even if I don't get an expert uh, who I am able to retain uh, in my own litigation. Jury verdict reporter and other services such as that, national and local, provide indexes of experts and case reviews from trials or settlements. Those are valuable areas to go to uh, in trying to find experts who have testified on similar areas of negligence. Again, be it premises, be it automobile, medical, construction, and the like. I would recommend strongly against, strongly against using people who advertise their services, who are part of expert data banks. Um, I'm never comfortable producing anyone who says they've advertised for this kind of business. It doesn't mean they're not objective. It doesn't mean they're not educated. It doesn't mean they're not qualified. I think it opens you up to unnecessary simple cross-examination. When you are the plaintiff, you are the person asking for money. You have to have credibility from the get-go when you stand in front of a jury. It's hard to sit there when your expert is being questioned about advertising his or her services, and you know how it ends up advertising to the highest bidder. It's your first meeting with your expert you're going to get an understanding uh, of a broad view of that expert's opinions. You'll provide information uh, to the expert orally or in writing, but you have to understand that an expert's opinions are really only as good as the information that he or she has been provided. I will at times send an outline to an expert just because it can uh, frame uh, where that expert uh, is, is going to be traveling, if you will, in the litigation. I make it clear, though, that my outline is not evidence. My outline is not a basis for opinions. My outline is an aid. Once you do that, though, you have to make sure that what you provide to the expert allows he or she the necessary bases, the necessary information, to formulate appropriate opinions. In a medical negligence case where you have a plaintiff who is permanently injured, for example, with cerebral palsy. In fact, let's take a, a child in a labor and de delivery case, and you have a child who's going to be permanently disabled by cerebral palsy by uh, uh, the static encephalopathy that you are claiming was caused at delivery or at another time. To have an expert talk about the permanent damage, the permanent injuries that this child is going to face without that expert examining the child leaves you open, leaves you open to very simple cross-examination. That expert needs to have as much information about the child's physical injuries as you can provide. And this means staying on top of updating your records for that child. Then the expert has to examine the child. If depositions have been taken in a case, you should give those to your expert. You explain to the expert, not everything in these, in these depositions are necessarily going to be relevant to her opinions. But it's important that he or she at least look at them and make that determination on their own. You don't want to be caught with an expert who has not reviewed critical deposition testimony.
the records in a medical case generally are what are going to provide the strongest bases for opinions that your expert has. But the shades of gray that come out of depositions can be very, very important. Provide those to your expert. If you have an automobile case and you have an accident reconstructionist who's going to talk about the scene, well, by all means, that accident reconstructionist has to go to the scene. Pictures are great. Google is great. What we have now uh, as plaintiff's attorneys and defense attorneys in terms of Google Maps, Google World, other computer resources, it boggles the mind what we had in the 80s and 90s. Nonetheless, you need to have your expert in that circumstance go to the scene. Ask your expert, what do you need to adequately formulate these opinions? Is there something that I have not given you that you need? You should go through the medical literature and have a medical literature discussion with any medical expert. If you have an engineering expert, request information from that person what is the relevant literature? Go through it. Have a discussion with your expert. Is this something that's important for your opinions? Is it something that should be a specific basis for your opinions? Each expert is going to rely on their knowledge, education, and experience, particularly when it comes to literature. Do you need a specific piece of literature to assist your biomechanicist? to form a basis for your infectious disease specialist. Those are circumstances that the ongoing discussions with your expert have to cover. You've now retained your expert. You're getting ready to uh, disclose her opinions in your 213F3 disclosure. What's extremely important is that you have maintained a comprehensive list of all of the materials that have gone to that expert. You need to know when you are preparing your 213F3 that everything that this expert should have, she has. When you are preparing the 213, you should have detailed discussions, final discussions with your expert. You should take accurate notes. Certain experts will want to prepare a report. That can be fine. Other experts uh, you'll have a discussion with, and you will prepare the F3 disclosure. It is imperative, imperative, that your expert reviews the F3 disclosure before it is filed in court. These are not your words. You're simply channeling the expert. If your expert does not agree with your F3, you do not want to learn that at the time of deposition. That can be a disaster. When you're preparing your F3, there can be debate as to how detailed you wish to be. There can be some advantages to being purposefully vague and leaving things open. There are advantages to being very detailed. Over the years, I've tried both tactics. In the end, I think it's better to be overly detailed. First off, it, may, it allows you to make sure that you are going to establish the points that you need to establish. You don't leave anything to chance. Secondly, it gives your expert a roadmap, a roadmap at the deposition. You know, it's always nicer to take a test when you have a crib sheet in front of you. The 213F3 provides a little bit of comfort for you and your expert at the deposition. So if I were to say one thing, I would say be a little bit overly detailed, particularly relative to the facts of your case, facts that form the basis of the opinions that your expert has. 213F2s can provide an opportunity uh, when you're dealing with treating physicians or other professional witnesses who will offer opinions that are assistive to you. 
if you've had the opportunity to meet with a treating physician, let's say on an element of proximate cause, and that physician has opinions that are favorable to you. In an automobile accident where you have someone who's had a severely fractured femur and you have an orthopedic surgeon who's going to offer testimony that the accident caused the fractured femur and is going to offer opinions as to what the future holds for your plaintiff. You may be well served to prepare a detailed F2 for that physician and have the physician sign it. I've had circumstances where I've dealt with treating physicians and there is a long period of time between your meeting and the time that physician gives a deposition. It was very helpful that I had a written F2 that the doctor was willing to sign on. I sent it to him before the deposition. He looked at it. He acknowledged our conversations concerning it. And he stayed true to the opinions that were in the F2. Made for a very, very straightforward deposition. Remember, your expert is only as good as the information that he or she has been provided. The rubber hits the road at the time of trial. That's when you expect your expert to bring forth the opinions that are going to help you win your case. That expert has to be prepared and prepared intensely before trial. Cross-examine your expert. Don't believe your expert knows the file in the way you know the file. By the time you get to trial, you are going to have understood what the defense experts have to say. Discuss that with your expert. When your expert is testifying at trial, let her do the testifying. All of the preparation from the moment of your first phone call to the time that this witness has taken the oath on the stand should now come through in her testimony. If you've done your job, this expert should be able to persuade the jury, whether it's as to duty, proximate cause, damages, how the crash occurred, how a fall occurred, whatever you need to prove. There's a saying, garbage in, garbage out. Good experts give good testimony. Bad experts do not. Be critical of your expert throughout the process. The only way to succeed in some of these cases is with quality expert testimony. You control that. If you need information relative to where to find experts, really the best thing for you to do is talk to your colleagues. Read depositions, go to the verdict reporters, see who is succeeding and see which experts are there. Make yourself knowledgeable about your case, be it medical or otherwise. Read the literature. The only way you know your expert is going to do well for you is if you are well informed. I wish you good luck.